Hey guys, welcome in. This is your lesson for Thursday, April 7th. Um, one quick announcement or one quick reminder before we start. Um, if you are interested, uh, I will be having office hours from 11 to noon today. Uh, post, the, post the link for the uh, Google Meet in Google Classroom. So just go ahead and click on the link. Uh, pop in if you have any questions. Pop in if you just want to say hello. Um, it doesn't. You don't have to stay for the whole hour, obviously. Come in and out as, as you'd like, uh, but I will be there and am available if, if anybody wants to jump in. So um, let's let's jump in and or let's continue talking uh, about the judicial branch. Um, so before we start, I posted this video. It's a nice four-minute tour of the actual actual courthouse itself, the actual Supreme Court building, uh, which I think is, is fairly interesting and gives you some insight as to the history of the court a little bit. Um, but from there, uh, just as a review, remember we talked about uh, the idea of a rule of four and being the um, way that the Supreme Court decides what, ca what cases they're going to hear and what cases they won't. Uh, if four of the nine justices decide um, that they want to hear a case, they want to hear a review of a case, they want to um, they want to ha they want to make a decision on a case, uh, then they will do so. Um, from the minute that they decide that they are going to hear a case, they, they issue what's called a writ of certiorari. Uh, a writ of certiorari is essentially just a request or a notification from the, the Supreme Court um, to a lower court, whether that be to an appellate court uh, or to a district court that, hey, we are, we are going to be reviewing uh, a case that you've heard previously. We are going to look at it. We're going to make it a potential new decision on it. We might agree with you, uh, but we're going to hear a case that you've already heard. Um, so in the event, uh, that the Supreme Court decides to hear a case that's been heard um, already by a different federal court, they will they will issue a writ of certiorari um, to that lower level court to notify them. The kinds of cases that the Supreme Court uh, hears most often typically um, fall into one of a couple of boxes. Either first, um, a lower court ruling, something that one of the lower courts decided either at the district level or the appellate level conflicts with a previous precedent a previous precedent. Um, there's some sort of new constitutional question. Um, maybe the best idea or the best example of a new constitutional question has to do with uh, your right to privacy when it comes to things like the internet. Uh, obviously, the qu questions surrounding and involving the internet were not something that had really previously been decided on um, up until 20, 25, 30 years ago. Uh, so at that point, the Supreme Court was likely to hear a privacy case involving the internet because it was a new constitutional question. Excuse me. Um, if the circuit court, so if the appellate court differed uh, with a district court, um, it's, it is more likely that, that the Supreme Court will hear the case in that, in that situation. Um, or if a lower court holds a federal law unconstitutional, right? So if a, if a district court or a district court decides that uh, a law passed by Congress uh, or a federal law of, of any variety is unconstitutional. Um, the Supreme Court uh, is likely to hear uh, that to hear the appeal on that case or to review that case after the fact, right? But those really are the four buckets or the four the four examples of the different types of cases that the Supreme Court tends to, to lean towards. One of the people that's going to be critical uh, in any case that, that appears in the Supreme Court is going to be the Solicitor General. The Solicitor General really functions uh, in four key roles, and, and we're really going to narrow that down to one really, really significant one. Uh, the first three, yes, they're important, but for the sake of the conversation today, uh, it's that fourth one that really matters. But the four functions of the Solicitor General. First, uh, a lot of times they're going to be they're going to be involved in deciding whether or not to appeal cases that the, that the government has lost. So if a federal court rules against, or a district court rules against the government, um, the solicitor general is part of the, is a big part of the, of deciding whether or not to appeal that decision. Um, they decide if they're going to uh, use any briefs or if they're going to, they're, if they need to modify any of the briefs that the government has had presented uh, on their behalf. Um, in some cases, uh, the Solicitor General will will submit an amicus brief. So if there is a case in a federal court um, that relates to or could apply to the federal government but doesn't directly involve the federal government, um, the Solicitor General can, su can submit an amicus brief. Uh, a good example of that would be um, Brown versus the Topeka Board, Board of Education. It did not specifically in involve the federal government. Um, but it was absolutely important to the federal government to see uh, the way that um, 
to see the way that uh, separate but equal was going to be uh, ruled upon in that particular case. So the Solicitor General would step in uh, and file an amicus brief uh, in that one. And then the fourth and probably most significant function of the Solicitor General is to represent the government before the Supreme Court. So if the if the federal government needs a lawyer, if they're going if they're going to be a, a litigant uh, in a Supreme Court case, uh, the Solicitor General is going to be the person. Um, that argue that makes the argument on behalf of the government. They're going to be the, the lawyer working for the government. Similarly, uh, the Solicitor General is going to work uh, hand in hand. They're, they're going to work very closely um, with the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court justices to decide uh, or to to be a part of that preparation process. Um, so when just when Supreme Court justices know that they have or federal justices know that they have a case coming, um, before the oral arguments begin, before the lawyers meet and or the lawyers come to court and actually start arguing the case, um, Supreme Court justices are going to look all over uh, to help them prepare. They're going to read previous doc documents involving the case, maybe from lower courts. Uh, they're going to talk to. Um, any parties involved that, that maybe aren't directly related. So if there are interest groups or different organizations involved, they might talk to them. Uh, there's a chance that they could talk to senators or members of the house uh, if if a senator or a member or a house member is uh, an expert on this on the subject. Uh, but they're going to prepare in a wide variety of ways. But maybe um, one of the things that they're going to do most frequently is they're going to go through and they're going to read a ton of briefs. They're going to read the briefs from the previous rulings from the lower courts. They're going to read amicus briefs from all different sorts of organizations and people. Um, and they're going to meet with people that have, that, have, that have authored those amicus briefs if they need further, further clarification. All of that is going to be work done by the justices uh, before the actual court date um, in the Supreme Court. So there's going to be a ton of prep work on behalf of the those nine justices uh, to make sure that they are sufficiently prepared uh, for the case when it actually um, comes before the court. Now, when it actually when a case actually comes before the Supreme Court, when uh, it is actually trial day, so to speak, um, a, a court court or a case in the Supreme Court is going to be really fairly short. Uh, a lot of the work, a lot of the argument is done by the prep work done by the justices ahead of time. Each side only has 30 minutes um, to make their argument. So they get 20 at, at, at 25 minutes. Uh, there will be a white light that flashes um, notifying the attorney that's making the argument, hey, you got five minutes remaining. After five minutes at the 30 minute mark, a red light will come on and that means your time is up. So you each side has 30 minutes to make an argument. And, and the reason for that 30 minute time limit time li time limit is again a lot of the prep work a lot of a lot of the background has, has already been digested so really um, that 30 minutes in front of the court is is to persuade or to bring about new information if you have any uh, or to kind of put the final touches the finishing touches so to speak uh, on your case it really isn't to uh, review the case from start to finish um, you'll notice uh, as as we get more and more into the judicial branch, specifically the Supreme Court, that everything is sketch based, right? Well, um, the reason is there are no cameras allowed inside the Supreme Court. If you watched the video uh, posted at the front of this lecture, um, there's only been two active photographs that we know of of the inside of the Supreme Court while there's a trial going on, and in both of those cases, the camera um, the cameras were snuck in by members sitting in the gallery. There are 330 public seats. You can't bring a camera. Uh, and unless you have a ticket, once once the, tr the proceedings begin, that's it. Anybody that's not in already, you're not coming in. So it is a very private, very closed off um, part of the federal government. Um, and, and the justices, the Supreme Court justices have largely removed themselves um, from the camera, from the pu pub public limelight as much as they can over, over the course of American history. Once those oral arguments are done, once, once each side uh, has had their 30 minutes in front of the court, um, it's not like... It's not like the way you see it on TV, where each side gets 30 minutes to make their make their case. The 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 judges come meet in a room, they make a decision, and boom, we're done in one day. Um, it really isn't going to work that way. After a case is argued in the Supreme Court, um, justices are going to meet uh, in weekly conference. Um, sometimes for months before they actually end up making a decision. Um, so the way that those weekly conferences uh, truly work is. From the first Monday in October until June, the, the court will hear oral arguments in two-week cycles. For two weeks, they'll hear these arguments um, 
30 minutes aside, they'll hear multiple cases and they'll hear one after the next. And then the two weeks after that, so for two weeks, they hear arguments in court. The two weeks after that, they meet in conference, they reflect, they debate, they go back and forth. They make sure that they are, they, they are as informed as they can possibly be before making a decision. Um, and at some point, when all of the when the justices get to the point where they feel like they've they've gathered all of the information they could possibly gather about a particular case, that's when the actual voting will take pl- will take place, uh, and the chief justice will be the person kind of running the show. He'll be the one directing traffic, so to speak, um, when it comes to the weekly conferences and the voting. The results themselves stay secret until the the opinion is announced. So just because the voting is done, just because that we know that there's a five four decision in so-and-so's favor doesn't mean that we get that information information immediately. We don't get the information on, on what the decision was or how the voting went until the opinion is announced. And I, I really like this quote because it kind of gives you um, – it gives you a sense of the role of everybody in the room, right? They go around the table, the chief justice starts and he, he kind of lays, lays out the scene for everybody and says, okay, here's what the question is. Here's what we're deciding on. And then he says, here's the direction I think I'm leaning. And he tells everybody, okay, this is why I believe this is the right decision. Then it goes to the next justice who does the same thing on and on and on. And nobody speaks twice. Everybody gets one turn to speak until everyone has spoken, right? It, it's it's a, an incredibly meticulous and processed base um, room where everybody gets their chance, everybody has their say, and eventually by the time you're done and everybody's spoken, you start to figure out, okay, here's kind of what the decision might start to look like. But no, there is no debate. There is no back and forth until all every justice has had their opportunity to kind of say, here's where I stand as of now. Then the debate begins, then the back and forth begins. Uh, and at some point, at some point that or in some cases, I should say that can go on for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time. While that's going on, America essentially is just waiting for a decision because they get no information until everything is done, everything is written, an opinion has been authored, and the whole thing is finished. Ultimately, um, there's a couple of there's a couple of pieces that can take place once that deci- or once that that voting has taken place and it comes time um, comes time to uh, author an opinion. First, we need to we need to get into what is this idea of stare decisis. Stare decisis is a Latin phrase and it, and it means to let the decision stand. Uh, most cases. Most cases that reach appellate court uh, are are settled on that basis. So that's I mentioned this last time. Ninety percent uh, of cases that reach an appellate court, the appellate court does not overturn the decision of the district court. Once it reaches the Supreme Court, that number goes down a little bit. But in some cases, they will still uh, act on that principle of stare decisis to say we're going to let the decision stand. We don't see any any worthwhile evidence to to overturn a lower court's decision. Ultimately, once the voting has taken place, whether it's a a a concur, whether it's a decision to let a lower court's decision stand or a reversal of a lower court's decision, whatever the case may be, uh, a, an opinion has to be drafted. And and the first thing that we're going to that we're going to um, talk about when it comes to authoring opinions is the majority opinion. The majority opinion um, is basically the decision of the court. Uh, so if you're looking at, I don't know, um, say Brown v. Board of Education, the 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 decision is that separate but equal uh, is not constitutional, right? That's the decision in Brown v. Board of Education. The person that kind of lays out the view of the court that says, okay, f- five people, six people, whatever it is, say that separate but equal isn't constitutional, they're going to write out exactly what the court's what the court's thoughts on the issue are, what their thoughts on the evidence of the case is, why they made the decision they made. That majority opinion is going to be an extremely important part uh, of the process. Typically, it's going to be the chief justice that either decides to write the majority opinion um, or decides which member of the court is going to write the majority opinion. Uh, if you're looking at uh, NFIB versus Sebelius, uh, the 
Supreme Court case we discussed earlier this year involving Obamacare, um, Chief Justice John Roberts decided to write the majority opinion himself. Um, he also has the opportunity or has the authority to designate that and to allow somebody else to write the majority opinion if he wishes. Now, on top of the majority opinion, and the majority opinion uh, is kind of the one that everybody looks at and says, okay, this is what the court said. There are two other types of opinions um, that can be offered. Those would be dissenting opinions and concurring opinions. A dissenting opinion is going to be um, somebody that voted that voted in the minority. So if a court has a 5-4 decision or if a court has a 6-3 decision, the dissenting opinion is going to be written by a justice that was on the losing end of the vote, so to speak, right? And they're going to kind of lay out that what their reasons were, why they believed the other side was the correct, the correct side. Concurring opinions are going to essentially act as supporting documents um, for the majority opinion. They're not going to be authored by the same person. They're going to be authored by somebody else, but they're going to kind of be a supporting document for the majority opinion saying, yes, the majority opinion says this, but we also believe that that was the right answer because of X, Y, and Z. That's what's going to take place uh, in the concurring opinion. So there are three There are three real opinions that can come out of the Supreme Court. The majority opinion, uh, which says this is what the court's decided and why, a concurring opinion is going to act as a kind of um, a supplementary piece or a further evidence for the majority opinion written by somebody else. And the dissenting opinion is going to be authored by somebody uh, on the losing end of the vote, so to speak, saying, here's why the people in the room disagreed with the majority opinion. Majority opinion is extremely import important, as I've mentioned already, because it establishes precedent. It, is, it sets a precedent, and a precedent is really the pivotal piece uh, of judicial proceedings in the United States. And precedent is essentially just how have similar cases been decided in the past, right? It, it, I know I keep going back to Brown, but it's, it's a really simple one to understand, I think. Uh, the precedent that is established in Brown v. Board of Education is that separate but equal is not constitutional. So in any case, in any case involving the idea of separate but equal or separating people based on race, the Brown decision is going to be a precedent. The court is going to use the Brown decision and say, okay, we've already said that separate but equal isn't constitutional in a school. There's a precedent there. We've already, we've already established that and it is going to be um, really useful in informing their opinion on other similar cases. So precedents are, are really um, critical and they're established by majority opinions. So when talking about the way that, that justices craft their opinions, it really comes down to two schools of thought. Um, the person you're looking at on the screen right now, I've referenced him several times in the last week or so, um, that is now deceased Justice Antonin Scalia. Uh, Scalia's opinions, um, similar to maybe Clarence Thomas's opinions, um, tend to rely or reflect his belief in originalism. And originalism is simply um, the, the interpretation that the Constitution should be interpreted the way that it was originally written, that it, it is not a flexible document, it is not a living document. Um, it is a question, every case is a question of WWTFD. What would the framers do? What did the framers intend when they wrote the First Amendment? Okay, that's the that's what originalism looks like. So when Antonin Scalia or Clarence Thomas or pick whatever justice you want that is an originalist or a strict constructionist, when they make a decision, what they're looking at is okay, what does the Constitution say word for word? I'm not trying to apply it or manipulate it or change it to make it relevant in 2020. I'm looking at the way that it was written in the 1780s and 1790s, and that's what I'm going to base my decision on. Marco Rubio, um, former presidential candidate uh, and current senator from Florida, said the Constitution is not a living and breathing document. It is to be interpreted as originally meant. And it's a really good example uh, of what originalism is or what strict constructionism uh, is all about. Originalism and strict constructionism tends to be favored by conservatives, right? They they tend to lean out, to lean on it and like uh, a court that uh, makes decisions without trying to modify and tweak and interpret the Constitution for modern and contem contemporary needs. They don't think that it's the role of judges um, to interpret the Constitution in 2000 differently than they would interpret the Constitution in 2020. They don't believe that's the role of the Supreme Court or the role of the judicial branch. Rather, they believe that, that those interpretations uh, are much more um, in line with the job of the legislative branch. 
On the other end of the spectrum, uh, you have loose constructionists. Uh, the three women pictured there, Justice Kagan, Justice Sotomayor, and Justice Ginsburg, um, they are loose constructionists, and they very, they very much believe um, that the Constitution is a living Constitution, that it is a live document, that it is intended to be, that it is intended to be um, changed something that can be edited or changed uh, as time moves on um, that there's no way there's no way that the framers could have anticipated uh, some of the changes that have taken place in the United States when they wrote the Constitution 200 plus years ago they could have never ever foreseen changes like the internet automobiles television telephones so on and so forth and we can't ask we can't ask uh, the Constitution to not be a living document we have to interpret it we have to um, look at it and and read it with a modern perspective, with a contemporary perspective. It is critical that we do so. Uh, and loose constructionists tend to be uh, justices that are appointed um, by Democratic presidents uh, and tend to lean a little bit more liberally. Uh, if you look at things uh, like the Griswold decision, uh, where we, we talked about um, contraceptives, essentially uh, the ability for um, people to sit, buy and sell condoms to buy and sell condoms in the state of Connecticut in the 1960s. Um, the Supreme Court decided that privacy is not is explicitly stated in the Bill of Rights, but it is implied throughout the Bill of Rights. Uh, this is a little bit more of a loose construction interpretation uh, of the Constitution. An originalist, somebody like Justice Scalia or Justice Thomas, um, or a, a, a more conservative justice would say that since privacy is not explicitly stated in the Constitution, you might not have a federally protected right to privacy. And then the last piece that I wanted to hit on today is the idea of judicial implementation. And judicial implementation, fairly simply, is how and wh in what fashion uh, are these court decisions translated into actual policy? How do they actually affect people's lives? How do they affect the behavior uh, of American citizens? These, the judicial branch and the Supreme Court are not a law enforcement group. So they rely on, um, they rely on other units of government, whether that be law enforcement, whether that be the legislative branch or the executive branch, they are much more reliant uh, on other units of government to enforce their decisions, right? If, again, using the Brown case is a really good example. Um, the Supreme Court can ultimately say that separate but equal uh, is unconstitutional, but they have no authority. They have no power themselves to actually make sure um, that schools, acro schools across the South, schools across the country are integrating. Ultimately, that responsibility is going to fall to other people. And as a result uh, of that lack of enforce, enforceable power uh, on behalf of the judicial branch, there are sometimes some 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 objections or some some um, people that stand in the way of implementing certain decisions. Right when we talked about your First Amendment right um, to freedom of religion, we talked about prayer in school. Um, I, I said, you know, prayer in school is kind of a weird gray area because yeah, if you guys want to come into the classroom and you want to say, you want to say a prayer, uh, I simply, I, I, I can't come in and make a big deal out of it. I, I can't, I can't participate and I certainly can't lead it. Right. But at the same time, um, unless it's, unless it's getting in the way or it's interrupting my educational environment in the classroom, uh, there's not a ton that I can do either because you do have uh, a First Amendment right to freedom of religion. I just can't be the person um, that is actually leading that, right? So if you look at that in the, in the context of school sporting events, uh, I know that some of our school sports teams say a prayer uh, before they go out and compete. Those kinds of things are absolutely um, kind of standing in the way of the implementation uh, of those decisions, whether you're talking or no matter which um, freedom of religion case you're talking about. But there are always uh, kind of obstructions or things in the way of implementing a judicial decision. And, and largely, uh, it becomes the role of the executive branch, the legislative branch, law enforcement, so on and so forth, to implement um, those policy changes. All right, uh, that's all I got for you today. Uh, I will not have anything for you tomorrow. It, tomorrow is Good Friday. I know we just talked about religion, so this is pretty appropriate. Um, but... I'm going to be off for, for Good Friday. Enjoy the, the Easter weekend with your families. I hope you all are doing well um, and you are able to enjoy your Easter weekend in some way, shape, or form. I'll see you back here next week. Have a good weekend.